Amen. Thank you for being with us this morning. I just want to welcome you to our Sunday morning worship experience. If you're watching online, thank you for viewing this morning. If you have a prayer request, go to the comments section and just put your request and we'll collect them this afternoon. We have a real treat today. Uh, Josh, come on up. Uh, he, he is with Evangelism USA. Uh, he is over Compassion Network. Uh, he, he, with God's help and the help of others, is Right now, they, they put in 15 hope centers in different cities across the nation and across the seas. They have eight more coming in this year uh, that they are ministering to, to, to drug rehab, alcohol rehab. And uh, people are being one to Christ, being, people are being set free, and it's just a very viable ministry. But one of the greatest things about him is a coach. Uh, he, he is 22 years younger than I am, and uh, he is my coach. And I'm going to tell you, he's a real leader. I, I, I love him. And uh, you're going to be blessed this morning. Let's give him a big hand this morning. It's good to be with you guys. Uh, if you brought a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. I apologize that my scriptures won't be on the screen today. Uh, we've, we've had a busy week. And I got up this morning and I was saying, hey, Lord, what do you want me to say? We've been in conference all week. But I, I can tell you this, I don't have all the verses for you for the screens, so you'll have to jot them down or open up your Bible to read them. But I do have a word from God for you. Is that good? Before we get into it, let me tell you about a story that I heard about over in Christianburg, Virginia. Is that far from here? Christiansburg, I think is the name of it. And there was a pastor that moved in over there and took this um, church. And the church was completely ran down. The grass was high. It was just a real mess. But he had a vision from God. And he needed a lawnmower, but he didn't have much money. And believe it or not, there's a little boy across the road with a lawnmower for sale, push mower, $25. Yeah, asked the little boy if it worked. He said, yeah, he bought it. He gets out there a few days later to mow that yard, and he begins to pull. And he's cranking on that mower, and it won't start. He looks over and sees that little boy and said, little boy, come here. He said, you, you told me a lie. You said it'd start. He said, oh, I forgot to tell you, preacher. He said, uh, it will start, but you got to cuss it. And he said, son, I'm a Methodist pastor. I'm telling you right now, I have forgotten. I hadn't cussed in so many years, I've forgotten how to cuss. He said, keep pulling that cord. It'll come back to you. So, Anyway. You go, what's that have to do with your sermon? Nothing. I heard that the other day, and I just thought it was so funny. Now, what I'm going to tell you here is actually true. It's Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, and it says, Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen any greater than John the Baptist. Do you know the Bible says that about John, that Jesus, when speaking about John the Baptist to the crowd, said, I want you to know, the goat. You guys know what goat means? Tom Brady, they say, when it comes to being a quarterback, is the goat, greatest of all time. Jesus said, John the Baptist is the goat. When it comes to man born of a, of a woman, now that word there for woman or women actually means married woman. And you read that and you go, wait a minute, is Jesus saying that John was greater than him? No, because Jesus' mama wasn't married. When she got pregnant, she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. She was a virgin. And the word used for Mary actually translates virgin. This word translates married or mature woman. But here's what Jesus is saying. Outside of myself, John's the greatest. He's the greatest of all time. And I read that this past week. And I started thinking. I, I began to have this question. Why? Why? What are the attributes of a man that makes Jesus Christ himself, when speaking about you, say, you're the greatest of all time? And I realize there's three things. And there's a scripture for each one concerning John. The first one is actually the verse right before this. We're in verse 11. If you just go up one verse to verse 10, here's what he says. Jesus gives us the answer. He goes, it was written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Great people in the eyes of God 
are people who are not trying to prepare a way for themselves, but they're preparing a way for another. If you like points, there's you a point. Prepare the way for another. We're in Virginia. I heard today for lunch with some of the leaders we're having a North Carolina or Virginia barbecue, but I heard there's some North Carolina barbecue sauce. I love that stuff. Never spoke in tongues till I ate North Carolina barbecue sauce. But all jokes aside, I, I, I remember when Billy Graham was being asked about his salvation, and they said, you know, you must be indebted to Mordecai Ham. He was the preacher, the evangelist, preaching under the tent. And Billy Graham got saved, and they said, you must be indebted. And Billy Graham said, well, I am, but I may even be more indebted. Because to, to an usher, but I don't know his name. And Billy Graham explained the story that he and his friend were actually leaving the crusade to go get into some mischief. Because the only reason he went is mama said he had to go. And they got there and there was no seat. So Billy and his buddy said, we're leaving. And there was this old man that ran out. He ran all the way through the field, caught up with them and said, young men, where are you going? They said, there's not a place for us. He said, there's always a place for you in the house of God. And he takes them back over there, makes two choir members get up and gives them a seat. And Billy Graham's point was this. He's like, if it wouldn't have been for that usher, I wouldn't even heard Mordecai and him preach. And if I wouldn't have heard the gospel preached, I at least wouldn't have got saved on that night. I may have got saved at some time. I'm not sure, but it wouldn't have happened on that night. He said, oftentimes we try to tie our, tie our salvation to, to the preacher, but it takes more than a preacher to get people to Christ. In that case, it took an usher. I heard you're going to be doing, I believe, a series. Um, I don't know if you guys are doing it here, but you're talking about the real you know, power of involvement of volunteers. I may be in the wrong church for that. I'm not sure, but even if I am, I want to tell you, if you don't serve, serve. That, here's what that usher did, and I want you to hear my heart. He prepared the way for another. I don't know if he's as great as John the Baptist, but I know he's in the list of God's goats. He's, he's great because that man made a way for a 16-year-old boy to get saved, and that boy would preach to 52 million people in over 190 countries. Isn't that amazing? He said 52 million. He actually would see 52 million salvations is actually what they say. I'm going to leave here this afternoon, and tomorrow I'll be in New York City. I get there tonight. And there's a friend of mine, his name's Bill Wilson. Has anybody ever heard of Bill with Metro World Child, Metro Ministries? And if you've never heard, never heard of Bill, when Bill was 12 years old, Bill, Bill believes this verse right here with all his heart. When he was 12 years old, his mother, who was a prostitute and an alcoholic, she dropped him off at a street corner, and she said, right in the middle of the city, I believe it was Boston, if I remember correctly, and she said, wait here. And he waited all day. He waited all night. He waited the next day, the next night. He, waited. he was still there waiting on the third day. He was afraid that if he, if he left, if he moved, that when she came back, she'd, she'd miss him. So he didn't leave. He didn't leave to go to the bathroom. You get the picture. He didn't leave to go get something to drink. He didn't leave to get food. He didn't have money anyway. This boy has been sitting there in his own feces, sitting there with no food, with no water, and a man pulls up. He was a Sunday school teacher at his church. And he had a son about, about Bill's age. And his son had leukemia. And they were just coming from the hospital. They had been visiting their son. And he went up to Bill Wilson, and Bill Wilson said, he put his hand on me and said, are you okay? Bill stuttered really bad, so Bill was trying to tell him, I'm thirsty. And I'm hungry. And the man picked up enough. And so he told his wife, go get him food and get him some water. The next day they had Bill in a church camp and Bill gave his life to Christ. Bill has spent the rest of his life as a Christ follower. He's 71 years of age now. He spent his whole life ministering to kids in New York City and all over the world. They ministered over 100,000 kids every week, 40,000 of them in the five boroughs of New York. They have these trucks, and they go, and they, 
where the masses of the kids are, the flats or the projects, they take this truck and they, and they let the side down and they call it sidewalk Sunday school. And they bring Jesus to the streets. And if you ever hear Bill talk about it, here's what he'll say. He still, to this day, if you talk to him about it, tears will pour down his face. And if you say, Bill, why do you do it? He still drives a truck once a week himself. Travels all over the world, but if he's in town, he drives, he drives a bus. If you say, Bill, why do you do that? Tears will be pouring down his face, and he'll say, because that little boy, that little girl, that's me. That's me. You know, Josh, what are you getting at? Here's what I'm getting at. Every one of us are called just as much as John the Baptist. You may not be called to eat locusts and wild honey. You may not be called to run around in rags and scream at the president or you know, back then he was screaming at what would have been the governor and, you know, and, and preach. You know, you may not be called to preach to politicians, and though God help us in this election. I don't care which side. I'm staying out of that. Let's just keep moving. You've never seen people get so mad when they talk about politics. But here's what I'll tell you. You may not be all that, but I will tell you this. God made you. In his image and in his likeness. Now we've all sinned and we get away from that as we're born and as we grow up. But then if we come to Christ, we come right back being conformed to his image and his likeness. And therefore it's all about finding place and discovering purpose. And what if I told you you weren't just putting this life for you? What, what if I told you that life's not just about preparing your own way, but life is actually about helping prepare the way for others so that they can meet Jesus. John prepared the way so that Jesus could be introduced to the world. Who are you supposed to be preparing the way for so that they can be introduced to Jesus? An usher prepared the way for Billy Graham to meet Christ. A Sunday school teacher. A man that had an ordinary job. An ordinary man that lived in a little house who had a son with leukemia, which meant he had some struggles in his life. He prepared the way for Bill Wilson to meet Jesus. And I just wonder, who is it that's supposed to be preparing the way for you? The guy that prepared the way for me, he was a bodybuilder. I used to work out in a gym. I still go to the gym, but I go right, I go to it and I park and there's a Mexican restaurant right beside it. Help me, Jesus. Jesus. I ate a Cabo taco last night or something like that. I'm coming back to this church to preach again just to go to Cabo taco. There was a guy that prepared the way for me in the gym. He used to share Christ with me, and it, and it, it offended me so much. I grew up in a very abusive home. My dad used to beat on me a lot. And, and physical abuse, I've had the finger broke, and I've been kicked in the ribs, punched. When he whipped us, he whipped us with two-by-fours, and and whatever he could find in the garage, or his fist, or his, you know, a kick to the, to the gut when you're down. But none of that was as bad as the emotional abuse we had. He would always say, you know, you're an accident. You being born has messed everything up. You're an obligation. Even my mother got cancer. He was trying to convince me, stage four, that she died of later. But he would try to tell me, you know, that's your fault. And it really messed with my head as a kid. So I had a lot of anger. We never went to church. I didn't know Christ died on a cross. I never heard that. And I go to this gym. I'm working out, and there's this big guy in there, and he's got hair back when, you know, having hair like this real cool. You know, you remember the mullet? You know, he's got the party in the back, the business in the front. And he, and he would talk about God all the time. One day I just let him know, you got you to gotta stop. You got to cut no more. Matter of forget, he said, go to church with me one time. If you go one time. I'll never talk to you about Jesus, God, church, anything ever again. And I went. And you know why I went? I didn't go because of my respect for God. I didn't go because I knew I needed God. I was angry at God. I was angry for my childhood. I was angry for watching my mother cry herself to sleep. I had a lot of anger in my heart. I went because of a man named Jeff. He had become my friend. I was a drug addict. I'd come in the gym someday so high, I didn't even know what was going on. There was times I spent all my money on drugs, so I didn't have enough gas to get home. And Jeff would take me to the, he wouldn't give me money, but he'd take me to the gas station, 
and he'd put 10 bucks in my car when 10 bucks would actually do something. I went to church because of him, not because of God. But I stayed in church because I found God there. I became born again. I got saved. Everything changed. Jeff prepared the way for me. An usher that we don't know the name of prepared the way for Billy Graham. A Sunday school teacher whose son was dying of leukemia prepared the way for Bill Wilson. And my question is, who are you preparing the way for today? And you may go, Josh, you don't, you don't understand, man. I got some issues. God doesn't want to use me. God will use a donkey. And if I was in my home church, I'd use another word, but I don't know if that's proper here. You've used it. Well, God will use a jackass. You understand what I'm saying? And so that means you're a real good candidate. Some of your wives just looked at you and went, oh, he can use you then. And that's what the Bible says. It literally, in King James Version, a man's ass spoke to him. His jackass spoke to him. His donkey. And you read that and you go, what? And, and God will use you. And God considers these little, I bet when that ushers, that seems so insignificant, right? Helping two boys that don't want to go to church, that want to go out and get in some mischief, helping them find a seat. <laughs> Tell that to Billy. I had a lady in my church that got saved because of a, a person that worked in the parking lot. They held an umbrella, knocked on her door, held an umbrella over her head. The guy out there in the poncho opened the door in the rain. She walked inside and she wept. Second marriage had failed. Both husbands were abusive. Both husbands cheated on her. Her dad was hard on her growing up. And she said, I sat in that parking lot and thought, should I go in here or should I go kill myself? And she said, then a guy named Cornbread. Yes, I'm from Humphreys County, Tennessee. He's been called Cornbread since he's a kid. That's all I know him by. You go, what's his real name? I don't know. Cornbread. He married a girl named White Bean. They had a kid named Onion. I'm kidding. But his name really Cornbread. She said he knocked on the door and she said, Josh, I'm telling you. She said, he said, ma'am, we don't want you to get wet. And she said, I thought on the way up, God, I've never had a man hold an umbrella over my head. Then she thought, I've never had a man open my car door or close it for me in the rain. She said, I got to the front and I said, God, I've never had someone open the door of an entrance for me. And she said, when I got in the lobby of this church, I broke and started crying. And a host greeter by the name of Susan said, honey, come here. Let's get you cleaned up. She said, Josh, that day I'd have joined a cult if it had been a cult. I've never felt so loved, so cared for, and that God cared about me and that I mattered to him to be treated that way. Listen to me. Don't, under, don't ever underestimate the power of just serving another human being in the love of God. And there's nothing greater than that. It'll make you a goat in the eyes of God. Prepared the way for another. Here, here's the other thing he did. He saw potential in another. In John 1.29, Jesus is walking. This is before ministry, before raising dead, before walking on water, before any of that stuff. None of that stuff's happened. Jesus is walking, and here, here's what happened. John sees him and John goes, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And you go, well, 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 he worked. No, no miracles, no nothing. John could see in Jesus what nobody else could see. Everybody else saw a carpenter. John saw, the Bible says, he saw the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. See, if you're going to serve people, then you've got to see people in the right light. Because if you become cynical of humanity and their sinfulness and the fact that we all fall short of the glory of God and everybody gets off course, what you'll do is you'll become more like the Pharisees, fault-finding and judgmental and harsh. But if you can be like one of the great ones, like John, then you can see in people what nobody else can see about them. John chapter 20, it's one of my favorite passages. There's a passage there, and it talks about Mary, John, and Peter. And it's the first Easter. It's the first time that everybody recognized the tomb is empty. It was a Sunday morning. It was early. Mary went while it was still dark outside. And if you start in John 20 at chapter 1 and go down, it literally says Mary goes to the tomb because Jesus has been dead now for 
for a few days, right? And she just wants to go to the tomb on that Sunday morning. And this is 1,986 years ago, so you know, from this past Easter. And she's just going to sit out there and just, you know how you do when somebody passes away. or Some people do. They go and they just sit by the grave, right? And just somehow it makes you feel close to them. It makes you remember. Feel like you're honoring them. And on her way there, here's what happens. She sees the stone's been rolled away. So she runs and she looks in the tomb and the Bible said she saw the tomb was empty and the body of Jesus had been taken. She runs back to Peter and John in tears. And she said, they've taken the body of the Lord. Peter and John, they run to the tomb. The Bible says that Peter goes in and the Bible says Peter saw. Now remember, that's the second time that word saw has been used. Peter saw. And when Peter saw, the Bible literally says, he looked in, he saw, and he noticed that the clothing of Jesus was still lying in its place. And also what the cloth that would have been over his face. And you go, what's the big deal about that? If you remember when Jesus was born, they brought swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes are burial strips. And when you buried somebody, it was like, you ever seen how they wrap a mummy? Swaddling clothes. Linen strips is what they say there in John 20. They would have wrapped the body of Jesus. Here's what Peter's seeing. Peter's seeing the fact that the strips have not been unraveled. Yet the body's gone. What do you do with that? It's like it disappeared. Mary says it's stolen, but Peter's going, but the, the strips are here. It's like, it's like the body, if it was a mummy, the body, the skeleton is gone. But yet nobody unwrapped the strips to get the body out. Then it says that John walked in, he saw and believed. It's actually three different Greek words used for the one English word for Saul. Three different words. See, we just read in English, Saul, Saul, Saul. But actually it says, Mary, blepo. And that means to see with your eyes. And that's why when you go down from verse 9 down to verse 11, it literally says she sat outside the tomb and she just wept. Because if you see things, if you see people, if you see circumstances, if you walk through this life, and you see the things that are temporary. If you see things with your natural eyes, you're going to get discouraged and beat up a lot. And there's a lot you're not going to understand that God would just love to give you some revelation on. Mary saw, blepo. Peter saw, therio. Or therio. And it means to see with a mind. To reason within oneself. Peter didn't see with his eyes, he saw with his mind, and he saw that the body literally looked like it had disappeared out of the cloth, and he's asking this question, and could it be? No. I mean, did it? Well, could. He sees it with his mind. John, John walks in. Edo. He edoed, he saw, and that word means to see with your heart. And you go, what in the world does that mean to see with your heart? Paul prayed for the Ephesians in Ephesians 1.18. He said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know what is his hope for your calling. Listen to what Paul said. Paul said, you've got a calling of God on your life, every person in this room. Some of you may go, I'm not even a Christian. I don't care. You've got a calling. And you go, but I'm not even a Christian. You had a calling before you were ever formed in your mama's belly. Now, whether you, ever, whether you ever adhere to that calling, wherever you accept it, whether you even acknowledge Jesus, you just need to know God's got a plan for you, whether you ever choose to submit to it or not. And I'll also tell you this, His plan for you is better than your plan for you. My little boy the other day, he literally looked at me, he goes, Dad, he's about to be five, he goes, I told him he couldn't do something, he's trying to get near the pond, digging under my fence. And there's like a drop-off down to my pond. It's like an eight-foot drop-off. And there's some stumps, and we're cleaning up. And he said, Dad, I got a plan. And he's looking at me like, I got a plan. And I said, I got a plan too. And my plan is going to rule on this day. And he walked back to the house, and he's just, 
and he's kicked the ground. And I sat down with him and I had a talk with him. And I said, I know you got this plan for him and his little brother that's three. I said, but your plan's going to get you in trouble. Your plan could get you hurt. Daddy's got a plan. And daddy's plan's better than yours because daddy can see what you can't see. Daddy understands what you don't understand. I know you feel like daddy doesn't want you to have any fun, but daddy's really trying to help you. He said, okay, dad. So what's the plan? I said, let's go get ice cream. He goes, your plan is good, dad. (laughs) See, some of us mope around and we kick and we wonder why God let me go through. And God's trying to say, I got a plan. But here's what I also want, want to say to you. Not just the circumstances in life. I, don't, I just don't want you to see those through the eyes of faith, through the eyes of your heart. I want you to see people through the eyes of your heart. See, the only way you'll ever prepare the way for people, and what I mean is serve people, help people, be kind to people, give, give a cup of cold water in His name. What does that mean? Do something for somebody else and do it in the name of Jesus. The other day, we're, we're getting at the checkout line at the dollar store, coming through Missouri. I took my family with me. I had to speak and do some leadership training. And my family went in this burger joint, and me and my little girl went in dollar store to get a little charger for the phone. And there's a lady in front of us, the cashier, and she didn't have enough money, and she got all her kids with her. She's got as many kids as me, and I got five. I had a lot of kids. You go, you must love kids. Not really. I love my wife. I'm kidding. Let's move on. That's bad. I do love kids. I love her too. So we're there, and um, long story short, this lady doesn't have money. And so I said, and she's walking out, and her little boy goes, but Mama, you promised. You promised, Mom. You promised we were going we were going to do something fun as a family or whatever he was saying. It was the saddest moment ever. And so I went, hey, 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 come here, come here, come here. And I said, hey, leave all that stuff on the counter. I've got it. As soon as I said I got it, I kid you not, her other child ran back, and I thought, what's happening? He grabbed something, put it back in there, put it on the counter. Another little boy grabbed a pack of bubble gum, he put it on the counter. And the mom looked at me, and I go, I got that too. But I thought, I feel like I'm home. What's going on here? I bought their things, and then, and then and it wasn't like a lot of money. It was just, you know, you're at the dollar store, like 28 bucks or something. And when we're getting ready to leave... The lady's just standing there, and she said, why would you do that? And I said, she said, why, why would you do that for me and my kids? And I said, because God loves you. Because God loves you. And I said, listen, he's done so much for me. I said, he, I was a drug addict, and he gave his son to die on a cross for me. And ever since I've realized that, it's like I can't, I can't do enough for us because of what he's done for me. And the lady just tears up. And she looks at her kids, and she goes, I told you God was for us. I told you God And it turns out she's a Christian, and she used it as a teaching moment to share with her kids, God's got our back. And I walked there, and my little girl said to me, she said, Dad, I feel good. I said, I do too. I feel poor, but I feel good. (laughs) You know, there's, there's opportunities like that. I shared that story the other day, and a mom came to me at a leadership conference, and she goes, my son had some money saved. And we, she goes, you're not going to believe this. We were at a dollar store, and in front of us was a lady, and she couldn't pay for her stuff. She was $3 short. And my little boy, she, I think he's like 13, she said, he took that $3 out, and he went up there, and he gave it to that lady. And the lady said, no, no, I can't take it. And he said, no, God gave Jesus from me. I can at least give this to you. She said, that lady broke. I broke. She said, the cashier is about to cry. Prepare the way. Not just prepare the way, but see potential in other people. You can't always see people as bad. I don't know how much time I got. I can't find a clock. How, how much? No, tell me. How much time I got? Am I out of time? I got two minutes. I'm going to take two minutes. But you got you to see, see potential in people. Let me tell you this one last thing. I, um, when I was... Uh, 2004, January, I got a call. A buddy of mine had five bullet holes put in him from my past. He was still an addict. I'm a pastor of a church. His mother calls me. I go and pick him up. And 
he's telling me the story, and I put him in this place, and I'm literally um, dropping him off at a friend's trailer for rent. She's going to give it to me for a week. I got another buddy going in there with a Bible. And I leave that day, and, and the Lord speaks to my heart about building a hope center. And it, it would take a while. It would take three and a half years. Not everybody was so excited about helping drug addicts. But we'd finally get it going. And, and I'll never forget when I decided to help that boy, Jeremy, and I started telling the story and telling people what God had done, I saw a pastor in a Mexican restaurant. Of, I won't call the name of the church or the denomination, but a pastor. And he came up to me and said, are you helping that Jeremy Bell? I said, yes, sir. And he said, why would you help a miserable drug addict? He said, he's a thief. I said, I know he is. He said, he's a liar. I said, yes, sir, he is. He said, I tell you what you ought to do. Instead of putting them up for free and feeding them. And he said, why don't we take him and every other bath addict in the county out back and we'll let them be shot. Every one of them should be shot. And I said, What? He said, 99% of them are never going to get off meth anyway. That's a statistic the sheriff shared the other day. You know, once we finally got the Hope Center going in our first graduation, I kid you not, I look in the room and guess who's in there? That pastor. And I thought to myself, he better not say a word. Now, I'm saved, but I will lay hands on him in an unbiblical way. I didn't realize the graduate turned out to be like his nephew. Or somebody kin to him. Could have been a cousin, great nephew, something. And I looked over and he's weeping. Right when it was about to be over, he said, can I say something? And he told the story of what he said to me. I couldn't believe it. And he's weeping. And he said, I was wrong. I was wrong. He said, All, I, I was looking with these. I'll never forget. He goes, I was looking with these. I should have been looking with this. He looked at me and said, Josh, do you forgive me? And I said, no. No, really. And I told him to leave. I told him if he wants forgiveness, get it from God. But you're not welcome here. I'm kidding. Don't amen. Make goodness gracious. I'm t Some of you are like, tell him, preacher. Of course I forgave him. Of course I forgave him. You know what happened to that guy is no different than what happens to some of us. It's happened to me. You stop seeing people with this, and you start seeing people with this. I want to give you one last thing, and I'm done. I really am. There's one last thing you got to know, though, and it's in John 3.30. Because I've read to you, you know, you have to prepare the way for others. I've read to you, you got to see potential in others. But here's the last one, John 3.30. He must increase. I must decrease. You go, Josh, I want to prepare the way. I want to serve. I, I, I want to see potential. I want to see people that way. I, I want to be a help. But I, I don't see those things. I don't have those opportunities. I, I, you know, I, I, I don't love people the way I should. Listen, if you'll fall more in love with Jesus, you'll fall more in love with people. John said, you can't say you love God and hate your brother. Truth is not in your liar. I don't like cats. My little girl just got a cat. Can't stand cats. But I love that cat because I love my girl. That cat's on me the other night, and I'm rubbing it and purring, it's purring. My little girl said, Dad, you hate cats. And I said, it's your cat. It's your cat. Now, any other cat outside of her cat, the only place I want to see it is at the Chinese restaurant. I'll eat some Kung Pao cat, lemon pepper cat. I'm sorry. I'm just teasing. I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. I don't mean your Chinese restaurants. I mean one in Tennessee. That... <laughs> but I love that cat because I love her. Do you remember in John 21, as I'm, I'm wrapping this up, I'll even step down here to prove I'm done. Just to prove to you there's hope. I'm ending. In John 21, Jesus looked at Peter after Peter had blown it really bad. I mean, cussed, lied, betrayed, son of God. Cut a man's ear off. I mean, it's bad. Peter really messed up. And Jesus looked at him and said, do you love me? And he said, I love you. Yes. And Jesus said, good. Feed my sheep. Asked him again, do you love me? Yeah. Tend my lamb. Here's what he's saying. Do you love me? And Peter would say, yes. And he'd go, good. Help people. 
What he was saying is, if you love me, love people. Help people, tend to people, feed people, take care of people, spiritually in every other sense in the word. How many of you in here love God? Raise your hand. I want to give you a word from the Lord today. You ready for it? Love people. Invite people to church so they can hear the gospel. If your neighbor needs help, help them. And take the opportunity to share about the love of God and God's love for you and for Him and the whole world. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me if you would. Lord, if there's anybody in here today and they don't know you, I don't ever want to end a service without giving an opportunity. So if they're in here today and they're not in a right relationship with Jesus Christ, if there's a chance that when they left this world, they're not going to heaven, they're going to that other place, and it's not a good place. That is not your will for their life. You love them. You are for them. You died on a cross for their sins, my sins, and the sins of the world. And today, if we need to repent of sin and turn to you and, and receive your forgiveness and your grace, if that's anybody in here today, you've got to get right with God in this place today. There is no judgment in here. There's just encouragement. And I'm telling you, it'll be the best decision you've ever made. And if that's you, and I don't know if there is somebody in here early morning service, but if you're here, I promise you're not here by accident. If that's you, raise your hand, and I'll pray a prayer with you before I leave. You can sit right there in your seat. We'll pray together, but you'd have to mean it. And I'm telling you, God, God would come into your heart and make things brand new. Is there anybody in here? Good. That doesn't discourage me one bit. Here's one thing i got to say to you. Next Sunday, let's bring somebody in here that would have had to raise their hand. I like it when everybody's saved, but I don't like the fact that there's no unchurched people in this church. We need some lost people in here that need to hear the gospel. So let's all try to do our part next week. Appreciate you so much. I love you. If I'm understanding correctly, we're going to spend a minute in communion. Is that correct? And they're up here, and you can take it freely. Um, so here's what we're going to do today. That is the body, that little cracker, and that is the blood, that cup. And I've shared it in the sermon with you. Christ died. The Scripture literally says, while we were yet his enemies, Christ died for us. Talk about seeing somebody with your heart. While we were his enemies, while I was sinning against him and my actions as though I were spitting in his face, Christ Jesus died for the ungodly. What great love is that? As you partake of communion today, I want you to remember that Christ loves you, that he is for you, and you thank him for his broken body and for his blood that was shed.